Disney's Contemporary Resort has been piling on the changes lately, from reimagined Incredibles-themed rooms to all-new dining experiences. But with those changes came a little heartbreak. The team and I were sad to hear the Contemporary's table service restaurant, The Wave of American Flavors, was closing up shop, but we were also intrigued by the promise of a brand new casual dining table service restaurant, Steakhouse 71. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Blog, and I got another review coming your way. Now that Steakhouse 71 has officially opened, the team and I have been able to try practically everything on the breakfast, lunch, dinner menu, and the lounge menu. Now we're ready to determine whether Steakhouse 71 is a step up from its predecessor, or if it still has some big shoes to fill. Let's get started. All right, Steakhouse 71 is located right where the wave used to be on the first floor of the Contemporary Resort. The Disney website recommends that you book an advanced dining reservation for this location, but if you're vacationing during non-peak times, you might be able to snag a same-day reservation on the My Disney Experience app. Honestly, even if you are visiting during peak times and you didn't make a reservation, it never hurts to check and see if one's available. That being said, if this ends up being a must-do dining experience for you, then yeah, make that reservation ASAP. You don't want to gamble on it. And if worse comes to worst, you can always go and eat in the lounge. You don't need a reservation for that. Now, reservations for Steakhouse 71 can currently be made 60 days in advance. That could change at any time, so stay tuned to our newsletter for the details. You can sign up at the link in our description. Now, if you're staying at the Contemporary, then getting to this restaurant's gonna be a breeze. But if you're staying somewhere either on or off property that's not the contemporary, then having that reservation is gonna be crucial to even getting into the hotel parking lot. Since resort hopping still hasn't returned to Disney World quite yet, you won't be able to drive up to the Contemporary without proof of stay or a valid reservation from one of their restaurants. Even if you say something like, oh, we're just here to eat at the Contempo Cafe real quick and then we'll be on our merry little way, those front gate cast members cannot let you park on site. So don't be stuck without a reservation. So why Steakhouse 71? What's the significance of this name? Well, the first part is pretty obvious, that with it being a place that has a variety of steak entrees to choose from, which I'll talk about in just a sec, the 71 represents the year 1971, the year Disney World first opened, hence why this restaurant made its big debut on the 50th anniversary, get it? Now, of course, many of us remember Steakhouse 55 in Disneyland, which had a similar vibe going on, was just closed this year. And it, of course, was called Steakhouse 55 because Disneyland opened in 1955. So you'll feel a definite similar vibe as you're walking into Steakhouse 71. There's a lot of big, huge black and white prints on the walls, which is kind of the same thing we had at Steakhouse 55. So I wanna definitely make that connection for you. And for those of you who are Steakhouse 55, devotees like myself. Now, Steakhouse 71 did not ride on the coattails of the Waves atmosphere. You guys always know that I used to really hate the Waves atmosphere because it felt like I was dining in a 1970s car dealership. And that's definitely how it felt. It was burnt sienna and there was no natural light. It just felt really awful in there. I did not like the vibe. Now, Steakhouse 71, from the moment you enter the restaurant, you're on a walk down memory lane. The elongated hallway leading up to the restaurant that used to have blue archways and dim lighting to take on a more under the sea approach now features those big black and white photos showcasing the development and grand opening of the most magical place on earth, Disney World, of course. I really like when restaurants set the mood like this from the get-go and immediately I got this sense of nostalgia and felt like I was looking at an old family photo album. So I guess you could say I had a wave of nostalgia. Yeah, that was a tasteless pun. Too soon, too soon. Now, while the wave, of course, was 1970s car dealership, Steakhouse 71 is a more sleek sort of time capsule approach. It definitely still feels like a hotel restaurant. It's pretty neutral right now but it does have a massive mid-century modern feel, which is what the whole hotel is going towards right now. The dining room's got a bunch of patterns, geometric designs on the carpet, spiky golden light fixtures, brightly colored abstract art depicting the different areas around Magic Kingdom. One of my favorite additions to this restaurant's atmosphere was the framed artwork that captured the essence of Tomorrowland, featuring scenes of guests riding the People Mover and Space Mountain. You still don't have any natural light, but one thing I love is that they've added a wall of windows looking into the lounge, which means you don't have kind of that enclosed room with just like 
one little tiny doorway that you can see out of. Now you've got a whole wall that looks into the lounge. So there is a, a little bit more of a distribution of light, I guess. And I really enjoy that. So overall, I'm 100% okay with the decor at this point. And I'm really, really glad that we got rid of the old color scheme. Now let's get to noshing. What does Steakhouse 71 have on its menu? Well, this table service restaurant serves up casual dining for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You can also enjoy a bite or two along with a cocktail over at the lounge, and that's attached to the restaurant itself. So let's start with breakfast. The breakfast menu has a tiny selection of appetizers, a bigger selection of entrees, a few extra side options in case the morning hangries are really powerful for you that day, a wake-up call list, aka the specialty alcohols, and non-alcoholic drink list with specialty and standard options. First up is the fresh baked breakfast pastries. The options here are pretty standard. You got your buttery and flaky croissant, your super cinnamony and super soft cinnamon roll, and your lemonade and chocolate chip muffins, which are kind of dry, but still had a decent flavor. The best pastry on this plate was the cheese Danish. Were my hands a little sticky from the icing and honey drizzled on top? Yes. Was I mad about it? Not at all. The cheese Danish had the perfect amount of flaky and buttery goodness. And for the main course, you got Walt's Prime Rib Hash, the Steakhouse 71 Seasonal Pancakes, and the Steakhouse 71 Feast, and that's a lot of food. Walt's Prime Rib Hash was something I was initially skeptical about trying since the meat came out pretty well done, which can make a prime rib rather dry if you're not careful. But it was still a good piece of meat and nicely seasoned too. What I liked about this dish was that you could get all the flavors, meaning the potatoes, onions, peppers, fried egg, and prime rib itself into one very flavorful bite thanks to all the bite-sized ingredients. Now, this is one that's going to fall victim to people who say it's too salty. For me, nothing's ever too salty, but some folks might think that this is. Steakhouse 71 seasonal pancakes are going to offer rotating flavors. When the team went, the flavor currently in the lineup was pumpkin. Now, I know you guys are all missing the sweet potato pancakes. So are we. We've asked about them multiple times, and they said maybe the sweet potato pancakes will come back as a seasonal flavor. We don't know yet. So everybody cross your fingers and wish, wish, wish real hard on star. And maybe we'll get those guest favorite iconic sweet potato pancakes back. Now the pumpkin pancakes came with espresso syrup, but don't worry if coffee isn't your flavor of choice, you can always ask your server for some regular syrup on the side instead. They were pretty to look at, but a bit on the dry side. Nothing that a little extra syrup can't fix. And with the extra syrup, the pancake stack had a better flavor and texture. And there was a little added crunch from pecans sprinkled on top. But if you are a big fan of a pumpkin spice latte, then these pancakes might fit the bill for you. Now, the Steakhouse 71 Feast is big and offers a ton of different breakfast foods across multiple plates. We're talking eggs, Benedict, scrambled egg, bacon, sausage, a Mickey waffle, bacon cheddar grits, breakfast potatoes, and the seasonal fruit. If I ever finish one by myself, I demand the servers from the 50s Primetime Cafe march over from Hollywood Studios to the Contemporary to present me with a clean plate club sticker because I deserve it. The Eggs Benedict has the traditional hollandaise sauce and a super runny yolk, though the flavor was nice, the English muffin it sat on could have been toasted a bit longer. The cheese and bacon grits, however, were absolutely stellar. I'd recommend eating these first while they're still nice and warm so you can get the full impact of that cheddar and bacon bit balance. Everything else on this plate is pretty traditional and pretty standard. The Mickey waffles were tasty, the scrambled eggs were okay, not weirdly rubbery like they can be at some restaurants, you know those ones, and the potatoes were crispy on the edges, soft on the inside, and a good amount of salty. But now it's time to wash it all down with some specialty drinks. The Iridescent Sipabration is a specialty drink for Disney World's 50th anniversary. You can find it multiple places, representing multiple different characters. And it's just standard Minute Maid Zero Sugar Lemonade. The specialty part is the surprise that comes with it. Each iridescent beverage comes with a decapitated Mickey head or another character head. And no, he's not really decapitated, but it's just his head. And when you drop the character into your drink, it'll dissolve and transform your lemonade into a pretty color with a a lot of iridescence, of course. Mickey doesn't really do anything to the flavor, though apparently it's supposed to taste like fruit punch or strawberry or something. I still thought it tasted like straight up lemonade with maybe a little bit more sugar. That being said, kiddos are gonna have a ton of fun with this interactive drink. And the Sherbet Punch is another specialty drink the team tried, made with orange sherbet, Sprite, and house-made grenadine. So that's sugar, sugar, and sugar. This one was very foamy and bubbled up over the glass like a baking soda volcano. Okay, not that eruptive, but close. And this fruity drink is super sweet, but not overly so surprisingly. I probably enjoyed the flavor more than the sip abrasion, but either option's gonna be fun for the kids. 
All right, let's move on to the lunch hour. It only felt appropriate to kick off lunch by tasting the sea salt dusted potato brioche because bread is life. And the brioche is served with a roasted garlic tomato spread and butter that has a 71 design on top, which I appreciated for all of three seconds before quickly spreading that liquid gold all over our bread slices. It's good bread, very light and airy, but the price for it is $12. And sure, I love myself a good chunk of carbs before my meal, but usually bread like this is complimentary at restaurants, especially at this price point. But if you need bread before your entree arrives, then this appetizer should curb that craving for you. But again, $12. The French onion soup, on the other hand, was super flavorful and worth the $10 it cost. Dare I say, it's some of the best French onion soup I've had in Disney World. The broth was rich and flavorful, definitely felt like they rendered it down quite significantly to get that strong of a flavor. The croutons were not overly soggy like they sometimes are in French onion soup. And the cheese was phenomenal, but it was a stronger cheese than sometimes you get on a French onion soup. So all the flavors here were a little bit stronger than I think I've had previously in Disney World. So just take note of that. I am a huge French onion soup fan. I eat French onion soup at just about every steakhouse I go to. So I am 100% game for those stronger flavors, but wanted to let you know just in case you're not. The bacon and eggs appetizer is an option that used to be offered on the Wave's old menu. It was a guest favorite and it's nice to see it return to Steakhouse 71. The dish itself is made with maple lacquered pork belly, smoked cheese grits, and a perfect egg, quote unquote. Now the perfect part means that the egg has been cooked, I believe to 145 degrees and then brought down slowly so that it's cooked just enough and then slowly cooled to give it a custard-like texture in the egg. Now, this dish is phenomenal. It's a different take on bacon and eggs. The pork belly is super fatty, super flavorful. They actually have a little sauce that you pour on it. And the custardy eggs have a different and subtle texture and flavor. It's not what you're used to when you just get regular, you know, bacon and eggs. So it's real good. And again, I guess it's a maple sauce. That's what I've got here in my notes. The maple sauce for the pork belly was really, really good. And again, rendered down so there's a lot of flavor in it clearly the chef at this restaurant understands that flavor is paramount now the steakhouse 71 onion rings are also lovely and golden then again I'm a sucker for all things fried and crispy and they are plant-based so you have no problem grabbing those if you are a vegetarian or vegan the spicy plant-based ranch dipping sauce had a nice unique kick to a traditional appetizer option I do wish that it was a little bit warmer I guess but I don't know maybe you disagree during lunch, the team ordered a fork and knife Caesar salad with a creamy Caesar dressing, crunchy and garlicky croutons, and thick shavings of Parmesan cheese. There was definitely a lot of flavor going on here, a lot of thickness to the dressing. It was a very powerful salad. <laughs> I don't know what that means exactly, but that's, that's the word that's coming to mind when I think about it. It's a very powerful salad. So I think this is a safe, fresh option for you if you're a big salad fan. Now, when it comes to entrees, the team and I tried out six different options at lunch. First, we tried the Steakhouse 71 burger, which is made with a signature blend of beef, American cheese, lemon aioli, red onion, and house-made pickles on a brioche bun. And this burger will change your life. It is truly one of the best burgers I've had in a very, very long time. Now, what the menu doesn't mention, oddly, is that the burger is also topped with a nice slice of pork belly. They kind of say it's like the bacon in a bacon cheeseburger, but of course it's pork belly and it is really phenomenal. I absolutely loved it. I had it a little bit later at the lounge as well. Still excellent. It's cheesy. It's a smashed burger, which means the patties are kind of smashed down on the griddle. And there is just so much flavor going on, you guys. There's almost a little bit of greasiness to it. Um, it's like a diner burger, you know, but at a really, really good diner. So I'm perfectly comfortable with this not being kind of a big fat patty burger. It's just so good. Like I said, I had it again later on in the week and it was just as good again. This is something I will probably dream about and get multiple times in Disney World. Now the Parmesan waffle fries that were paired with it and that are paired with a lot of things at lunch were a bit overdone and they were overdone again when I went to the lounge later in the week. They just felt like fries that had sort of been sitting around for a while. You know when you have waffle fries and they kind of get hard and crunchy, which is not how I like my fries. So even though they had a nice flavor, I really could only get through a couple of them because it just they the texture was not there. Um, so heads up on that. You may ask for your fries to be a little bit underdone when you go if you're the same as me. Now, the team did have the same fries with the steak frites and they were OK there. But still, again, not great. 
So let's talk about the steak frites next. The steak on top of the Parmesan fries was cooked just right. We wanted it sort of medium, medium rare, and it was a, a decent steak for sure. The chimichurri sauce drizzled on top provided a nice sort of slightly spicy flavor for the steak and waffle fries. It was a good, it was a very good dish. Again, I'd get the burger. And then there's the gourmet grilled cheese, which is probably the only thing that I would say would rival the burger for me on the lunch menu. So this is made with toasted brioche, gruyere, smoked gouda, shredded pork belly, of course. I, there's pork belly everywhere, which is why I love this restaurant caramelized onion jam and arugula. Now this was very, very good, especially that caramelized onion jam. It was super sweet and it complemented the savory elements of this sandwich, but if you don't like sweet and savory together, you aren't gonna like this because it has a very strong sweet component to it. So you may ask for the caramelized onion jam on the side and just put a little bit on um, so that you can sort of manage how much of that sweetness you have because it was real sweet. But the sandwich was phenomenal, definitely worth getting. And the pasta salad on the side, a good light option for those who don't want something fried with their entree. Now, here comes another sandwich, the prime rib sandwich. Fun fact about this one, the au jus sauce that the prime rib is cooked in takes the chefs four days to make, so of course my standards are very high. And yes, the flavor of the prime rib was very good, but the bread of the sandwich was a bit too much. Most of the time I was getting way more bread in the bread to meat ratio, which made the sandwich kind of dry and kind of chewy and hard to get through. So stay aware of that if you do order this sandwich. Now let's move on to the next one, crab cake sliders. These sliders were tall and what you have to do that's like kind of an interactive dish you have to smash them down before you take a bite because there was so much of that crab cake resting between the two buns so you just smash it down and that's what kind of gives them that crab cake look and feel if you're not a huge seafood fan or a fan of crab meat in general you should probably pick something else on the menu because this is a lot of crab meat and it's a very crabby dish now the last lunch entree we ordered was the vegetable wellington, which is basically the plant-based version of a beef wellington. If you're not a mushroom and artichoke fan, you'll wanna pass on this option, but if you are a fan of those two vegetables, then listen up. The dish was shockingly delicious. Like I'm sure we had preconceived standards for it, but it really, really exceeded those. It tasted like bacon wrapped spinach and artichoke dip with plenty of mushrooms. The sauce had a bit of kick to it, but nothing overpowering that took away from the wellington itself. So if you are a plant-based diner, this is gonna be a definite must for you. Now on to dessert. There were four dessert offerings for lunch and of course we tried them all because Disney food blog. Now for starters, the team and I tried the apple tart tatan made with caramelized Granny Smith apples, puff pastry, and blackberry gelato. This is a plant-based option. It's got warm, soft apples and a crunchy, thin sugar topping. And the only thing I wasn't vibing with was how crispy the bottom portion of the pastry was, but everything else had a nice, sweet flavor. I love apple desserts and there was a ton of apple on here. So if you are a huge apple dessert fan, this is a good option for you. But again, the pastry on the bottom, I was not vibing with, so heads up. Next comes the creme brulee. There's not a whole lot to say about this one. It was a really good creme brulee. You had a chocolate layer on the bottom and a vanilla layer on top. It was pretty standard, not something I'd probably write home about. Now the prettiest dessert at the party was the ambrosia. This was light and sweet, but in the end it was more style than substance. The ambrosia just tasted like a sponge cake with panna cotta and a little meringue. But if you're looking for a small post-lunch treat that's not gonna push you over the brink of being overly stuffed and miserable, then this one's a good one to try, but I'm not sure I'd spend the money for it. And last, but certainly not least, we got the Steakhouse 71 signature dessert, the Steakhouse 71 chocolate cake. The cake here features layers of whiskey infused chocolate cake, chocolate mousse, and raspberries. Now there are 15 layers and the 15 layers represent the 15 stories of the contemporary resort. Now those of you, again, who loved and adored Steakhouse 55 will remember their chocolate layer cake. This is a very similar experience, but a little bit smaller. Now the dessert tasted like a standard chocolate cake. It wasn't bad, but the only truly standout thing about it was the presentation. I didn't taste a lot of the whiskey in the chocolate cake. It was not a very alcohol flavored situation, so it was fine, but I probably wouldn't spend the money for it again. So none of the desserts here really wowed us necessarily. Now, now, as far as specialty drinks go, we tried out a few. The vodka gimlet was classy, very refreshing. An additional non-alcoholic vodka mixed in was a flavoring agent, sort of giving it an herbal taste. The Tequila Sunrise for two is the current fishbowl drink over there. It replaced the Seven Seas Lagoon. This is a very sweet drink, but you could still taste the alcohol a little bit. Now, if you enjoy a little bit of alcohol with your sugar, then this could be for you. 
The Fig Manhattan is made of monkey shoulder blended scotch. I don't know why, but the name of this scotch always makes me laugh. Cointreau Noir, Fig Simple Syrup, and Orange Bitters. Now don't let the fig name fool you. This flavor is just to add a bit of sweetness to the scotch. In the end, the fig is a good balance for this drink. And then there's the Raspberry Gin Sour. Now this one was very alcoholic. A little bit of raspberry and a whole lot of gin. So if you're looking for a stronger cocktail with a more potent alcohol taste, this could be the option for you. Time to cap off the Steakhouse 71 dining experience with the grand finale dinner. Now the dinner menu has a few of the same dining options as the lunch menu does, but it also has an added selection of Steakhouse cuts, which give this restaurant its Steakhouse name. You can also choose from a variety of specialty sauces to go along with your cut of choice. They actually have basically a sauce flight here, which I love. Now before we talk about steaks though, let's talk about appetizers. We gave the lump crab cakes another go by ordering them as an app and not in their slider form as we did for lunch. And you know what? I like them better this way. Still got that sweet crab meat flavor without feeling like I had to squish my food before enjoying it. When it comes to entrees, the team and I started with the Florida Sustainable Fish. And the fish was a little on the chewy side, but the lemon sauce gave it a great citrus flavor. The veggies that came alongside the fish were even better than the fish itself, and they were cooked in a little parchment paper pouch too. The chicken chasseur was moist and flavorful with a light and creamy parsnip puree. Again, if you're not a mushroom fan, you can just skip on over this entree option, but if you love them, then you're gonna love the giant mushrooms and mushroom sauce that come along with this dish. All right, now let's discuss the real stars of the show here, the steakhouse cuts. To really test the flavor and preparation of the steaks here, the team and I ordered the 12 ounce roasted prime rib and classic Yorkshire pudding. Go big or go home, right? And you know what? It was amazing. Really, really incredible. The prime rib was moist, juicy, flavorful. You can see from these images, it's just incredible. But what made it extra delicious was that sauce flight you can add on for an extra six bucks. So worth it. The flight comes with Bernays, a poivre, wild mushroom, whipped horseradish cream, chimichurri, and the red wine signature Steakhouse 71 sauce. The best of this bunch were the whipped horseradish cream and the signature red wine sauce, but they were all very good and definitely gave the prime rib a different vibe. The signature sauce was both tangy and sweet, while the chimichurri tasted sweet and herby. Each had a distinct flavor that set them apart, but still managed to complement the prime rib. Now, in case that wasn't enough food, I managed to sneak an additional side of macaroni and cheese on my bill. Now, this mac and cheese had a good panko topping, but was lacking a powerful flavor. There are a lot of other mac and cheese options on Disney property that blow this one out of the water, so I probably won't order this again unless the recipe changes or I just want to give it another chance down the road. But when we were at the lounge a couple of days later, we ordered the loaded mac and cheese and this was much, much better. So they're still coming out of the same kitchen, which means your mileage may vary with the mac and cheese. And finally, the au and potatoes. These had a garlic cream sauce that I may or may not be fantasizing about as we speak. They were perfect, thick, creamy, potatoey goodness. Definitely get these. Okay, so let's talk about price. What's the damage here? Well, breakfast was actually pretty affordable. No entrees exceeded $21, not even that heavy duty steakhouse 71 feast. Granted, most of the locations that do charge more for their breakfast options also include character dining. So if you're wanting to spend a little extra on breakfast with character dining, you can always head up to the fourth floor of the contemporary and eat at Chef Mickey's instead. Chef Mickey's also provides some more unique breakfast offerings, whereas the offerings at Steakhouse 71 feel a little more traditional. Now, lunch and dinner aren't the most expensive dining options on Disney World property, but these prices can still be pretty steep for a travel party dining on a budget. For lunch, the crab cake sliders were $19. The vegetable Wellington was $26. So if those price tags are looking to be out of your price range for lunch, you may want to look more into the quick service dining options on property, but note that those are still going to cost you anywhere from $12 to $16. So really the table service 19 bucks isn't that bad. That being said, the Steakhouse Cut dinner offerings provide signature dining quality for a lower price. The 12 ounce prime rib at Steakhouse 71 is $38. Compared to the Yachtsman Steakhouse prices over at Disney's Yacht Club Resort, where a 12 ounce New York strip is 56 and a 14 ounce roasted prime rib is 52. These quality cuts might be a little more affordable for you over here at Steakhouse 71. So definitely consider that. All right, now is it worth it? So Steakhouse 71, I think is a great new addition to Disney's Contemporary Resort. I think this hotel definitely was lacking a steakhouse when it got rid of its previous one. The breakfast options are standard but affordable. They're gonna provide you with a substantial amount of food for a decent price. As far as lunch and dinner are concerned, the flavors here were excellent. It definitely felt like higher end dining. 
especially with options like the French onion soup and the prime rib. The desserts were okay, and that's what I've come to expect from a lot of these table service restaurants. You come for the main food, and you go get dessert at a cool kiosk later. The restaurant is also nice and quiet. Sometimes the table service restaurants in the parks can be noisy and packed, but Steakhouse 71 is going to offer you a little solace, a little zen escape from Magic Kingdom. Now, although it was sad to bid goodbye to the wave of American flavors, but I'm not talking about your decor, I'm okay with that. Steakhouse 71 is a noble replacement, it's filled with nostalgic atmosphere, high quality food, it's a nice relaxing vibe, and it's definitely a reasonable cost. So I am all about Steakhouse 71, and I can't wait till you get the chance to try it. So I hope you stuck with me through this whole thing um, and got to dinner, because that's the best part. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.